Welcome everybody to our Friends from the Field webinar series. This is a series uh, cooperatively hosted by the Island Heritage Trust and Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And my name is Chrissy Allen. I'm the development director for Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And I'm really excited for today's uh, webinar. We are joined by Dr. Jeremy Jackson and Dr. Nancy Knowlton, as well as Dr. Hans Carlson and Julia Zell. Hans is the executive director of Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Julia is executive director of Island Heritage Trust. And we're gonna have a little presentation and hopefully a robust conversation about climate change, maybe talking about the new report that just came out and looking at how your two local land trusts are working towards uh, a more climate resilient, you know, peninsula and island and how we're viewing, viewing these changes that we're anticipating. Um, I'm gonna start by having Jeremy and Nancy give a presentation and I'll give a, a brief bio about each of them in case you are not aware of who they are. Dr. Jeremy Bradford Cook Jackson holds an emeritus position at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, as well as the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where he led the Center for Marine Biology and Conservation. He is also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. Jackson studies threats and solutions to human impacts on the environment and the ecology and evolution of tropical seas. He is a member of the United States National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has won numerous international prizes and awards. He is the author of more than 170 scientific publications and 11 books, most recently Breaking Point, Reckoning with America's Environmental Crises and Shifting Baselines in Fisheries, Using the Past to Manage the Future. So we're thrilled to have Jeremy here as well as his other half, Dr. Dr. Nancy Knowlton, who is sitting in the, uh, the driver's seat of their vehicle on the other side of him. And N Dr. Nancy Knowlton is a coral reef biologist who spent much of her career at the Smithsonian in Panama, at the, uh, at the Smithsonian in, in Panama, at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and at the Natural Museum of Natural, National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC prior to moving to Brooksville, Maine. She was also a professor at Yale and the founding director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. She is the author of Citizens of the Sea and former editor-in-chief of the Smithsonian's Ocean Portal. In 2013, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. She is a winner of the Peter Benchley Prize, the Heinz Award, the Women's Aquatic Network 2018 a Woman of the Year Award, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award, and the International Coral Reef Society's Darwin Medal. In 2014, she helped launch hashtag Ocean Optimism on Twitter, where you can follow her at Sea Citizens, and I'll type that in the chat. So that's a mouthful, but we've got some real heavy hitters here with us tonight. And um, I, will, I will let you all um, say a little more about yourselves and Hans and Julia, I'll let you speak <laughs> about your, your own background and bios uh, when, you're, when your turn is ready. Uh, Cause I think most people on here know who you guys are. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Jeremy and let you go ahead and start talking to us all about this fascinating topic. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, um, I've taken the, the role of just quickly going through the, um, the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out this year. Um, it's a little bit disappointing so far because it's really only the physical data without um, very much about what it's all going to mean to us in a practical way. Um, what it really has done is told us what we've known for 20 years, um, but with greater and greater and greater, ever greater precision and confidence. And in many ways, to me, the most important thing it shows is in this first slide, which is that the um, 
the changes that we've observed, not, you know, you, you're probably used to seeing predictions for the future, but what I love about this graph is it's changes so far as actually measured. And what it shows is that the observed and the simulated human and natural changes are virtually identical. So that the, the modeling, the, the stuff that's used to make projections has gotten to the point where it's really extraordinarily accurate and, and reliable. Um, now, why doesn't it advance? Okay, I have to do it here. So um, there are a lot of patterns. Um, I tried to save us from going through them, most of them. This, this is a, a map of the world, actually. All these little cells are regions of the world. So if you can see my pointer, can you see my pointer? Um, up here, GIC, that's Greenland and Iceland. And then down to the left is North America, Central America, South America. And all that red color says that there's been a real increase in hot extremes throughout most of the world. And NEN up in the top center, that's Northeastern North America. The three little asterisks means there's incredibly high confidence in the observed changes. And what it's telling us, we already know, temperature has been increasing where we live uh, to a very significant degree. But what this also shows is it's doing it almost everywhere around the world. And those shaded areas mean they just don't have enough data. Um, the next slide um, shows the same thing for changes in heavy precipitation. Um, the confidence for Northeastern America isn't that great in, in their analysis, although I'll show you something that shows that, it, that it's there. But you can again see a lot of the world is seeing big increases in heavy precipitation. And a lot of the world is seeing big increases in agricultural land drought. And this is Western North America there in extreme left, which I guess you already know is drying up uh, catastrophically. Um, future emissions cause additional warming. In other words, uh, we're stuck with what we've done. And every time we burn a ton of, uh, of carbon, we make even more and more. And it's all additive. And um, this, you know, there's no good CO2. Uh, for a long time, for a very long time, every time we add more CO2, we see a concomitant proportional increase in global temperature, the y-axis. And that's true regardless of the scenarios, so regardless of the simulations. So we can anticipate to see that continued proportional increase in temperature for as long as we keep doing the stupid things that we're doing. Uh, okay, so let's do a little quick context for the US generally, because I don't know about you, but, but I find graphs like that really sort of boring. Um, these are um, projections of global sea level rise um, by 2100, and they're the different ones from the last IPCC report. And they show for various scenarios, green, not too much more CO2, red, huge amount more CO2, et cetera. And what you see is a range of projections from about half a meter to two and a half meters of global sea level rise by 2100. Um, Zillow, which of course is uh, a real estate organization, not a bunch of raving environmentalists, did an analysis for the business as usual scenario and projected that 300 American cities in the United States would lose half of their homes if, if we continued business as usual. 30 cities would disappear. And for all those snowbirds, one in eight Florida homes would be underwater, assuming that we continue to be as stupid as we've been. Um, how much sea level rises is really dependent on Greenland and Antarctica. And these pictures of what Greenland looks like today are really terrifying. Because, you know, when I was born, there weren't any rivers like this on the top of Greenland. And what you see here are these rivers that are forming with massive runoff 
of snow melt and ice melt. And on the right, there's a close up. And friends of mine who've been to the top of Greenland and stood to next to one of these things said, you cannot hear yourself speak for the noise of the roaring water. And what you see in the foreground of the picture of the right is this water descending down to the bottom of the ice pack where it's lubricating the ice sheet on the top of Greenland. And the increase in ice loss is exponential. And frankly, we don't know as much as we'd like to know about this because this is the key to how extreme sea level rise is gonna be, not only in Greenland, but in Antarctica. As a consequence of all this, a huge number of cities in the United States, and these are just the ones on the East Coast, are gonna to be toast in terms of hurricanes and sea level rise. This is a picture I took out of an airplane a while back of Miami on the right and Miami Beach on the left because I grew up in the upper right-hand part of that photograph. And I know from personal experience what happens in every hurricane, but large parts of all these cities, including Portland, Maine in the bottom, are gonna be uninhabitable and are gonna require relocation uh, within um, decades. Um, New York City can probably buy 50 more years. Its average elevation is about 20 meters, but lower Manhattan, which is probably the most valuable real estate in the world, is only about a meter above sea level. And for a mere $25 billion, they can buy that time. Hurricane Sandy costs 65 billion but we don't have $25 billion in Maine for Portland and other places. So we don't really have that kind of option. The percent increases in extreme weather are off the chart. And look at the upper right, look at the Northeast. Um, what that's telling us is there has been a 71% increase in the amount of precipitation that is concentrated in extreme storms in the last 20 years. So not only are we getting more rain precipitation, but we're getting it in a really dangerous and unuseful form. And the only way we're gonna be able to use that water in the future is to build reservoirs, which are gonna cost again, megabucks that in Maine, we don't have the money for. California does, and they're already starting to do it. So all of this means stronger storms, flooding, tornado outbreaks, extreme out heat waves, and for a little statistic for our friends in Texas and the Southwest, it is projected that in 10 or 20 years, heat deaths from extreme heat waves will exceed the number of people who die in automobile accidents in the United States. So this is a big deal. Uh, Lake Mead, uh, which is one of the two great reservoirs in the West that provides California, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, um, and Nevada. Um, all that white is where the water level has gone down in the lake. It is at its lowest level in history. All the major cities in the West are in extreme drought. The worst is Los Angeles, then Houston, Phoenix, San Antonio, Las Vegas, Dallas. Texas has four of the most uh, endangered cities in terms of drought in the country. Groundwater depletion is off the chart. And I love this picture on the right. Plight of Phoenix, how long can the world's least sustainable city survive? They, um, they get a lot, of, most of their water really from the Colorado River. And after Colorado itself, California then gets second choice. And then Nevada gets third choice and Arizona gets fourth choice, which means they're not gonna get any water and their groundwater can provide them with a couple of months reserve. So Phoenix is truly the city that waits to die. Um, hurricanes are increasing in frequency. This has been a subject of huge argument, but the data now indicate that this is in fact true. But what's more concerning, and that's concerning for us up here as well, is that the proportion of these storms that are really bad, categories three, four, and five is increasing due to increases in ocean temperature. And this, this slide shows how this works. So this is a picture of the Gulf of Mexico and the Southwestern Atlantic. 
And really red means places where the temperature of the seawater at the surface is vastly hotter than normal, like four or five degrees warmer than normal. So let's look at the history of a couple of hurricanes. The, the first one is Hurricane Michael that you may remember a few years ago. It started out in the Caribbean as not even a tropical depression. It meandered its way north, no threat to anybody or anything. And then it hit this anomalous hot water. And overnight, it transformed from a category one hurricane to a category four hurricane. When it hit Panama City, it erased Northwestern Florida. And I mean erased. An entire US Air Force uh, base was leveled to the tarmac with no surviving standing buildings. And Hurricane Harvey in in Texas was the same sort of thing, a pokey little depression that intensified when it hit hot water and dumped a meter of rain in 24 hours on Texas. So these, this heating of the water, and as Nancy's gonna tell you, the Gulf of Maine is really much hotter than it used to be. And that means that hurricanes that make it to the Gulf of Maine are gonna be reborn. And that's not good. Okay, so very quickly, some summary of the update to Maine's climate future report. If you haven't looked at that, it's a fantastic resource from the University of Maine, always being updated and very informative and user-friendly. So I guess as we all know, temperature is increasing and this dashed line, this light dashed line shows you the average increase of three degrees Fahrenheit um, in the last um, 100 years or so, but you can see that somewhere around 1960, the slope of that line is increasing. And so it's getting hotter about twice as fast now as it was before. And you can see here on the right that the highest statewide annual average temperatures are just going up and up and up. Um, and um, you could say, oh, wow, look at this. The growing season is longer. And that's sort of nice. Um, precipitation is increasing. That's what you see in the top. But snow is decreasing. That's what you see in the bottom. You might even think that's nice. Um, but what does that mean? Uh, it means uh, less ice, less frost, less snow, less snowmaking. It means more thaw, it means more bare ground, it means, it means a whole lot more mud, and it means a huge increase in insect pest survival, which we all know from the increase in Lyme disease um, because of abundance of ticks. I mean, this is a terrifying graph, and it really is arguably the greatest health hazard we face in Maine, but remember the brown tail moths last summer? Uh, invasive mean weeds, pine borer disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is going to be a huge uh, issue increasing exponentially just in the next 10 years. And then the last thing I want to talk about, I wrote half a book about, is sea level rise. Uh, and these are the sea level rise curves for different places in Maine. And you know, you look at it, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, maybe a tenth of an inch a year. Um, well, that means in 10 years that that's an inch, you say, oh, well, that's not so important. But then look at Portland in 2018, because what you have to understand about sea level rise is that every, let's say, foot of sea level rise means that the reach of waves in a storm is going to be 100 yards further inland or even more, which means that little bits of sea life sea level rise translate into what you see in this picture of Portland. And we're going to see more and more and more of this. The road that leads to my house three years ago uh, had breaking waves over it with seaweed dumped on top of it. And in order to get to my house from South Brooksville, it's going to be necessary to build a bridge in 10 or 20 years. And this is going to be multiplied everywhere. So I've done my little thing. Nancy's going to talk a little bit about the Gulf of Maine. I'm going to mute myself. I got to stop sharing my screen.
I've got to turn my sound off so you can't hear me. And uh, go ahead, Nancy. You don't need it. Just... All right. Okay, I think we get the. Yeah. yeah. There. Good. Alrighty. So, um, thanks, Jeremy. We're actually sitting next to each other in this car in front of the Brooksville Library. It's just that I have a nice screen background that's from the middle of the Pacific Ocean to remind people of the ocean when it comes to climate change. So I'm going to share my screen now. And hold on just a second. There we go. All right. So what I'd like to do is focus a bit on, on the effect of uh, all of these things that are happening uh, that Jeremy mentioned on, on, on the Maine in particular, and in particular Maine's ocean. So here you see uh, a graph of temperature anom anomalies. What that means is how many degrees colder or warmer the temperature is for each year compared to what is average. So average would be zero. That's that red line across the middle. And as you can see, um, the temperature in the Gulf of Maine has been increasing very rapidly uh, since about uh, the year, a little before the year 2000. And in fact, the Gulf of Maine is one of the most rapidly uh, increasing uh, uh, temperature locations in, on the entire planet. Uh, that's what we have up until now. You can see in the, the black line is a, a running as an average over many preceding years and the blue lines are the actual data. So you can see that you know we're up pretty high here. In fact, the last five years are the highest recorded average temperatures ever uh, for the Gulf of Maine. And as, as, in, as big as that is, uh, depending on how many, how much more greenhouse gas emissions we have in the future, we can expect somewhere between one degree and over three degrees centigrade increase by 2050. So it all depends on what we do exactly, how much worse it gets. Now you think, well, what's one degree centigrade? That's about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, three degrees centigrade is, I mean, is is close to six uh, degrees Fahrenheit. You say, well, that doesn't seem like that much. Of course, you get that much of change in a day. But think about, I think it's more effective to think about it in terms of you know, what would our bodies feel like if our own temperatures went up by 1.8 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, we start feeling pretty ill. Uh, and certainly by uh, six degrees Fahrenheit, we're feeling very, very, very sick. And of course, most of the organisms that live in the ocean, they don't regulate their temperatures the way mammals um, and birds do. They actually, their bodies are the temperature of the ocean. So we're talking about fairly drastic uh, increases in uh, temperature for the Gulf of Maine. So this it's not just the temperature that changes, the temperature change creates a lot of other changes. So um, both the surface water and the bottom water are gonna get warmer, but we're also gonna have more heat waves. And that's important because sometimes the worst damage is caused not by the average temperatures, but by these heat wave events, which uh, boost the temperature way above average, and those can have really catastrophic effects. Uh, the, salt, the saltiness at the surface is going to decrease because of all the melting ice to our north, but the saltiness on the seafloor is going to increase. It's going to actually increase. The mixing of the water is going to decrease, and that's important because deep water brought to the surface brings a lot of nutrients. So if the water, be, if the layers become more uh, stable and strong, it's harder for those deep water nutrients to get to the surface. And then finally, one of the other things that carbon dioxide, which is creating all these other changes does, is it actually dissolves into the seawater. Sea in fact, the planet would be a lot, uh, the air would be a lot warmer if a lot of the carbon dioxide, had, carbon dioxide hadn't dissolved into the ocean. But that changes, on the other hand, changes the chemistry. And it makes it much harder, for example, for organisms um, to lay down their um, skeletons and a lot of other different effects. And so, um, so that's what's happening to the ocean. And perhaps not too surprisingly, there are a lot of things happening to the organisms that live in the ocean because of this. And here are just two examples from really the last month of news. One is uh, what happened to puffins this year, uh, really catastrophic impacts on the puffins because of the warm uh, water. About 90% of all the puffin pairs fledged no chicks whatsoever. And all the 
uh, puffin chicks that did uh, survive were about 40 to 50 percent smaller. They called them like micro puffins. And uh, this is clearly has bad implications for the future of puffins. The other thing that's happened, this is a story just from the Bangor Daily News a couple of days ago, is that invasive crabs are wreaking havoc on the main coast. And this was a really interesting story about how citizen science and particularly high school students are tracking these invasions. Now, in general, if you want to sort of stepping back and think about what, what's happening uh, to main sea life, there, there are a couple of things that are going on. Uh, first of all, in, in general, uh, organisms are moving north and they're moving deeper because that's where colder water is. So the, most species try to stay in a place which is what they're best adapted to. So if the water gets warmer where they are, they move somewhere where it's closer to what they're best adapted to. And that's northern, more northern waters or deeper waters. So as a consequence, and you've probably read about this, right whales are moving north. It's making it much harder to manage the impacts on right whales. And they're having a, they've had a very bad um, set of reports, a lot fewer white whales now than they were 10 years ago. Uh, in contrast to what had been going on before where their numbers are actually slowly increasing. Uh, cod numbers and lobster numbers are expected to decrease. Puffins, as I mentioned, are expected to decrease. Some species, of course, those that come from more southerly waters are gonna increase here locally because they're also moving north. So we're likely to see more squid and more sea basses. Now, as I mentioned, diseases um, are likely to increase and, in, and invasive species like green crabs are likely to increase. Uh, things like bivalves, that, that is oysters and mussels and clams are likely to decrease. And that's because some of these crabs eat them and also because the changing ocean chemistry is making it harder for the clams to lay down their shells. And then salt marshes are likely to decrease simply because as the seawater gets higher and higher due to sea level rise, if there isn't a place for them to migrate, which is the case in, in many situations where human settlements are right there on the coast, essentially they enter a place called a, called a coastal squeeze where they really squeeze out of existence because they have nowhere uh, higher up to migrate to. So those are some of the impacts on main sea life. And now I'd like to say a few things about what we can actually do because it's really, it can sometimes be, um, uh, it, it feels almost self-defeating to simply talk about all the effects and then not uh, say anything about what, what we should be doing in response. And, and essentially there are four things that we can do. One, and these involve both individual actions and collective actions. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that there's things that we can do individually, but also by creating uh, policy changes uh, and, and, and groups of people working together, there's a lot we can do in the power of numbers as well. So the first thing we need to do is reduce local stressors. And um, in the case of the ocean, that means uh, reducing destructive fishing and reducing pollution. And the reason that matters is because a lot of the damage that has occurred to the ocean actually started happening well before climate change became a big issue and would still be a problem. And so just like when you're trying to uh, get your family finances in order, if on the one hand, there's some big bill you can't do anything about, what you do is try to reduce your other expenses so you're better able to cope with that big bill. The same thing is true in terms of ocean conservation. Reduce all the local stressors that you can. The second thing we absolutely have to do is of course reduce climate change itself. And that means reducing greenhouse gas emissions and it also means working to sequester carbon because uh, plants uh, use carbon dioxide and, and when they turn that, that carbon dioxide into roots and wood and things like that, they, kind of, they trap it, they take it out of the atmosphere and trap it. And so it can't heat the planet anymore. And I think you'll hear in the subsequent presentations a little bit about the role of forests, for example, in carbon sequestration. We need to build resilience. That means uh, having uh, coastal infrastructure that is able to deal with the climate change that's already built in that we can't do anything about. And we should operate with a precautionary principle, which it, uh, means that if we have any doubts about what we, you know, something might be happening and might be bad, to work on the assumption uh, that it will happen and act accordingly. And then finally, a really important thing to do is talk about what is happening and what can be done and is being done. Uh, uh, this is it, this is the power of our voices, is, uh, our voices both in terms of our spoken voice and our votes is uh, really substantial. And that's a big part of addressing climate change. Uh, 
And so here are just a few examples from Maine uh, along those lines. Um, one is uh, the four-year climate action plan that has been uh, recently in, uh, unrolled, which includes a 45% reduction by 2030. It's a very ambitious goal and 80% by 2050. Uh, there's been a big build out of uh, charging stations for electric vehicles. Jeremy and I own an electric vehicle. Um, we really appreciate the charging stations on the main turnpike. We need more. When we went to get our vaccines, we had to go to Presque Isle initially because of vaccine supplies, and we actually had to rent a gas car at the Bangor International Airport because there was no place to charge our electric vehicle heading north. So that's there's there's room for more, uh, but we're at least moving in the right direction. And then, of course, there are all these innovations, lots of small startup, innovative young people. An example on the right is the idea of using kelp. Um, like, as I mentioned, forests can sequester carbon and trap it. The idea is to grow kelp and then sink it to the seafloor where, where it too will trap the carbon dioxide. Those are just a few of examples. Uh, there are many, many examples in Maine and I urge you to find out about them. And then finally, here are two uh, recent resources that talk about not how bad the problem is, but what we can do. And, and they're fundamentally hopeful books. It's not to say that they don't uh, recognize the enormousness of the challenge that we face, but they provide a blueprint for how to, to how to address that challenge and, and get us back on track for a sustainable planet. And that's Saving Us uh, by Catherine Hayhoe. She's actually the chief scientist now of the Nature Conservancy, which I serve on the board of, of and also in, as a main trustee. And uh, she's a very uh, distinguished climate scientist, but also a great science communicator. And I, I encourage you also to go on you can Google uh, Catherine Hayhoe and watch some of her videos about how to talk to people about climate change. Uh, it's actually very useful advice, particularly coming up with Thanksgiving. There's always somebody at the Thanksgiving table uh, in many cases, which is not if someone who's not missed, maybe still doubtful or somewhat resistant about the reality of climate change. Uh, that book provides a lot of suggestions about how to talk to people in that who are in that place. And then finally, a very new book um, by Paul Hawken, who uh, originally wrote a couple of years ago, the book Drawdown. He's got a new book called Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation, which is exactly, of course, what we have to do. So with that, I think I'll end and turn it over to the next person. Great, thank you so much to both of you. That was a lot of a lot of information. And as, <laughs> as one of our panelists said, it feels a little bit bleak uh, to have these conversations, but I think it's good to, to end on that note, like you did, um, Nancy, with what can we do? You know, like it, it can feel really hopeless sometimes, but there is work that we can do, and there is work that is being done here on the peninsula, and a lot of people thinking about this, and I've been sort of taking notes and jotting down questions, and I encourage our um, our attendees to write questions in the chat that you may have, and I'll be I'll be monitoring that and asking. Um, but first, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it over um, to our two land trust executive directors to hear from them about how your land trust is really being informed by the the research that's coming out and the information that's coming out about climate change and the, the sort of changes that we're going to be facing, we're already seeing here, but that we're gonna be facing more and more on the peninsula, uh, not just with the effects of climate change on the landscape itself, but with the development pressures, things like that, um, that are coming along. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll toss it to Julia first. Sure. So, you know, I think both Nancy and, and Jeremy touched on this a little bit, but I mean, so many of these problems feel so huge. And here we are in, you know, Blue Hill Peninsula, Deer Isle, Maine, you know, what can we do locally or individually? Uh, because so much of what needs to happen needs to happen on a global scale. And Hans actually um, spoke to this when he um, responded to the report back in August. I was looking at that the other day again. And, um, and I think one of the things that keeps coming up for me in discussions with our board, our committees, our, our stakeholders, our members, our community members is so much of what we can do is be a conduit 
uh, or, or bridge builders, um, perhaps literally and figuratively. For us, you know, we've we've always enjoyed hosting educational programs about all manner of things, but really focusing on maybe holding more opportunities to translate scientific data that I think a lot of our community maybe doesn't always pay attention to or doesn't understand and then translating it into what can you do? What can you do in your own backyard? Can we can we redefine the aesthetic of the manicured green lawn outside of your home and, and encourage folks to let it grow and be a pollinator habitat um, or make, you know, homestead scale changes that help, you know, uh, migrating bird populations or, you know, et cetera. And that for me is how I feel like we can make a difference as an organization you know, in small ways on a local scale that is part of a bigger global impact. And I I am not a scientist. I'll be the first person to admit that. And so I look to folks like Nancy and Jeremy and, um, you know, some members of my staff who have more expertise on this. What can we do? What is what is the, the science telling us? You know, as Jeremy said at the very beginning, this report sort of tells us what we've already known for some time. But take that and how can we you know, take action, even, even on a small scale. Um, one of the things also for us on Deer Isle, you know, that's different than the Blue Hill Peninsula is, you know, you look at the island, you look at the geography, you look at the landscape and it's already very segmented. And for us as an organization, we also have 21 offshore islands that we're already monitoring and stewarding. And that's gonna, the, we made this joke at the very beginning, that number is gonna increase. Um, you know, we're already looking at the causeway from Little Deer Isle to Deer Isle. It's already underwater in, in strong storm surges. I mean, it has been for years already. And we as a land trust actually own property uh, on sort of multiple sides of that causeway. And actually, you know, I. I know that Jim Fisher and the town of Deer Isle is talking with Maine DOT and other relevant partners about what's actually going to happen there. I don't know details, but our properties might end up needing to be a part of, you know, how are we going to make sure that we can continue to have emergency services and resources delivered to our community? How do we make sure that the socioeconomic impact of that going underwater isn't devastating? Um, and it's in a, kind of an unusual position to be in. So. I'm definitely still learning, but those are some of the some of the topics that are being talked about, you know, within our our organization. Go ahead, Hans. Yeah, I think sort of echo echoing something that Julia just said. I, I, it, it. This is an overwhelming problem, <clears throat> and we have to think seriously about what we can do and what we can't do at the local level. <clears throat> um, you know, obviously this, this problem is a global problem. It's going to require global action. It's going to involve major policy change, major economic change, um, all of which has to happen at a level far above anything that happens on the Blue Hill Peninsula or on the islands. That said, um, there, are, there, there are a lot of actions that we can take. And I think action action's important um, in a couple of different ways. Um, there are practical effects of action, but as Nancy pointed out, um, action is a way of growing hope as well, right? And that's, the, you know, this, this our, I think one of our biggest dangers here is growing hopelessness, that there's, you know, that we just can't do anything about this. Um, I, I think what we are really doing in the conservation world is rethinking what it means to do conservation, um, uh, particularly nonprofit conservation, um, which traditionally has been about buying and holding land and, and offering recreational opportunity and, and um, protecting habitat. Um, and really what conservation is going to have to mean going forward is all of those things, but, but also um, actively working on our land to do the kinds of things that Nancy was talking about. Um, you can protect a forest and sequester carbon. Um, you can, in, in many respects, manage a forest 
um, for increased carbon sequestration capacity. And that's gonna be really important. Um, I think we as organizations need to think carefully about resources that are going to become scarce. Um, uh, you know, we live in a water rich state and we are talking about these extreme water events that are happening. Um, and yet we live in and we conserve land in areas on the, this peninsula and the islands, which are not water rich. Um, and that's a, that's a limiting factor that we are gonna have to think carefully about. So thinking about groundwater, thinking about wetlands that recharge groundwater um, and how those get protected. Um, I think, thinking of different ways that we can use our land, our conservation land in other ways. Um, we'll throw one example out. Blue Hill Heritage Trust is leasing some of its land, an old gravel pit actually, to a company which is developing a composting facility. <clears throat> um, and, and of course, rotting food matter is one of the biggest and dumbest um, <laughs> um, greenhouse gas emitters um, on the planet. Um, so we can do things, you know, we can, we can act in that respect. I think something that I haven't heard mentioned here yet today, I think Jeremy mentioned it in an email the other day, that in the scheme of things, Maine is actually going to look like a pretty good place to be um, when you compare it to some other places. And um, I, I, I believe that after 200 years of demographic stagnation in this state, um, we are going to see an increase in population. And so thinking about not how we stop in population increase, not how we stop development, but how we try to shape that in a way, um, I think we have an opportunity here to build, as, we, as, as things build on this peninsula, to, to work to build them in better ways than they've been built in other places that are that are more durable, more sustainable, whatever word you want to use for it. Um, so that, I think there's a there's a role for that in in uh, in private conservation. Um, it's not our it's not ours alone, but it is ours to work in collaboration with towns and other organizations to try to to find solutions to to these problems. Um, so yeah, I I. I as Julia just said, we're sort of feeling our way in the dark here a little bit and trying to find the tools that we need to rethink this, this issue. Um, um, and yeah, and there are, there, are, there are definitely things we can do. Um, and, and, we need, and we need to do them here at, we need to do them here in our locality and have hope that other people are doing them in, in their localities as well. And, and then hope and pray that the politicians um, <laughs> do what they're supposed to do as well. Go ahead, Julia. And Hans, to, to, to piggyback off of that, something that I was also thinking about recently, we both of our organizations also work with local school children. And yes. while that's sort of maybe a longer term game or not game, but, um, the impacts of that are not necessarily going to be immediate, but I know that we both, both our organizations do that and work together sometimes to, to really try to make a robust um, sort of supplemental environmental education for, for local school children around here. And one of the things that came up recently when I was speaking with our educator and, and some folks at IHT is you see these kids out on these preserves and they just have this sense of awe, this sense of wonder at, at, the, at this place and that it, maybe it's beauty, maybe it's bugs, maybe it's you know whatever they're taking a look at. And I think one of the other things that we as a land trust with public preserves and trails and providing access that we can do and that I think we found through this pandemic is offer an, an opportunity for adults to rediscover that sense of wonder and maybe also recharge mentally and emotionally and physically in these beautiful places and maybe stave off that hopelessness. Yes. Um, and I think that that's, it's kind of hard to quantify and it's not so concrete, but I know I've heard folks say, thank you so much for protecting these places so we can get outside and enjoy them. And remember just how much this world and this, you know, this place means to us. So I think that that's, I, you know, sort of goes without saying sometimes, but that's one of the things that land trusts in general, I think, 
uh, continue to provide and it's it's really critical and and maybe trying to find further ways to talk about that and actively encourage it um, is is one of the things that we've been talking about as well. Kids are kids are hugely that it's a, such an important thing. It's it's one thing to you know at fifty eight years old to look at the next twenty or thirty years of change. It's 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 scary enough, but from you know from the viewpoint of my fourteen year old or somebody else's ten year old, it's it's it staving staving off hopelessness for them is even even more important. Yeah, absolutely. Nancy, you brought up the importance of sort of talking about this and helping to, you know, educate people and talk about this. And I know since we're on that topic, um, I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on sort of really good models for talking about this and educating either the adults in the room or the, the next generation of voters and leaders. Um, and you know what we've all seen work and what our strategies are or what we've seen really not being a good tactic for that sort of thing. Well, I'll, I'll jump in right away and say, as I mentioned, Catherine Hayhoe's book does, discusses this a lot, but one of the things she really stresses and I couldn't agree more with her is the importance of not, I mean, especially when you're talking to someone who might be resistant or unsure the not to begin with lots of facts, um, but really to, to to talk about shared values and what you what you most care about, and only then sort of transition to discussing climate change. So, uh, Catherine Hayo is actually she lives in West Texas, and she's an evangelical, so she deals with a lot of audiences who are not necessarily really receptive to the threat posed by climate change, and she always talks about how much. You know, you know how much the West Texas landscape means to her when she when she talks to audiences like that, and then talks about, but it's under it's under threat, and we have to do something to change the 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 trajectory that we're on, and and for that reason, I think uh, talking about you know what the various land trusts are doing and the and how much I mean there are very few people who live in Maine who hate trees I suspect and uh, so you can talk about the you know the shared connection you have to the out the beauty of the Maine outdoors and then talk about after you've sort of built that bridge then talk about what you're worried about and what we can do about it and I do think it's really important to talk not just about the problems but also the solutions because we've had essentially several decades of doom and gloom and it in some ways it hasn't really moved the needle but talking about the successes what's working um i mean the increase in renewable energy possibilities with the drastic drop in in prices of uh, solar and wind energy also there are all sorts of things that are actually working well it's just that we have to do more of it and we have to do it faster i want to come back to what julia said um about education, because I think it's a very fertile and important ground. And I've done, um, I've taught for a few years until the pandemic at the elementary school in Brooksville. Um, and we've done field trips, for example, about sea level rise where we all get in the school bus. And then we drive around Coastal and Bagaduce Road. And I let them show me where um, they're gonna need to build a bridge soon or raise the road. And um, I've also taught at George Stevens, uh, I guess about half a dozen times now, and they are extraordinarily receptive to discussions about climate change. They find the, the usual dialogue pretty depressing. They, they want to be engaged. And I think for both your organizations, it's something um, that you should really continue to be involved in because, I mean, I get feedback from the teacher I do it for at George Stevens, and I get emails from the students, and, you know, this is extended to things like the relationship between climate change and the pandemic and the local main environment, um, and they're thinking about these things. So, um, and you know, if you remember seatbelts, well, I'm old enough to remember when seatbelts were instituted as law and parents resisted, but kids are the ones that made them buckle up. Yeah. So that um, they are in effect a mole for getting to the parents um, yeah. through their enthusiasm. 
I, I just think it's super important. And, and I got to tell you, I love doing it. It's, it's so much more enjoyable than the scientists I deal with on a regular basis. <laughs> That's great. Well, I know, you know, for the, for both of our organizations, educational outreach has over the last, you know, five to seven years really exploded in not just in the community, but in the local schools. And um, I can speak on behalf of our outreach coordinator, Lander Nesbitt, who has been working really diligently with the schools for the last couple of years. She has the same experience that you've had, Jeremy, where the kids are really hungry for this information and they're on board. They really, they really care about it. They're and, scared. Um, they're yeah, scared. they're like they Greta Thunberg, they're scared, but it's really important to be Socratic. It's sort of like what Nancy was saying. It's really important to let them tell you. Um, if you go in there and show them a bunch of boring facts, like a typical IPCC report, and they <laughs> totally tune out. <laughs> And that's, by the way, just as true. I, I, I can tell you, I'm glad I don't teach anymore in universities, but it was it, the same sort of thing. It's just people switch off unless yeah. they are approached in a way that engages them. Yeah. Well, I think, Julia, you guys are seeing a lot of success in sort of talking about these environmental and climate issues on the island and, you know, with a lot of these kids whose parents are involved in the fishing industry who are seeing the effects of climate change in real time and seeing it hurting their industry. What sort of things are you hearing from Martha about that? Yeah, big time. So, so Martha Bell is our environmental educator and she's getting close to um, a full seven years, I guess, in the schools, um, pretty much full time during the school year. And in that time, she's gone from seeing sort of the general conversation around climate change or even using that phrase as taboo to now totally accepted, I mean, generally speaking, that it's that the children, it's part of their dialogue and it's more, much more accepted and, and talked about regularly. Um, and that's huge. And I think that that's indicative of their parents as well, right? Um, I mean, they're, they're sponges and in their home life and, and in their school life. So that's been a really huge shift that she's seen. And um, one of the things they, they did a, a project a couple of years ago where they went and sampled water from the Stonington Harbor here, where like you said, many of their parents fish out of Stonington here. And they sampled the water and they were doing a, um, unit on plankton, they were looking under microscopes, but Martha knew that they were gonna find microplastics, but she didn't, she didn't say that's what they were doing. They were just gonna look at plankton under the microscope. And this whole room of kids looking at microscopes, look, you know, looking for moving plankton or whatever's in the water. And all of a sudden, oh, what's that bright pink string? Oh, you know, and they start running around. And, and as you guys mentioned, they led the conversation. You know, Martha knew she kind of picked a place that she was sure would have some microplastic pollution. And again, it's where their parents fish out of and, but knew that they would find the discovery and, and find excitement and then go home and talk about it. And they prompted a, putting together a book and a report that they published and talking to their parents about it and saying, what, well, what's, what's going on? Can you stop throwing your trash over the boat, you know, off the side of the boat? Um, can we go pick up trash along the beaches? Uh, you know, so it, it, getting them to sort of start the, get excited about something and, and take the lead has really grown, I would say. Uh, you know, I think when Martha was first starting working with the schools seven years ago, it was a lot of, you know, let's go out to the preserves, let's talk about, um, you know, these plants or these animals, or let's just get outside to get out of the classroom. And it's really shifted to, to topics and, and issues. And that a lot of times it's student driven and it's, it's been pretty remarkable um, hearing her talk about the, the shifts and the changes and um, you know, what that's, what that translates to. Uh, so yeah, it's been pretty, pretty amazing. And it will continue to, you know, do everything we can. And actually now seven years, I mean, Martha mostly works with middle schoolers but they now, she's taught folks who are now young adults and, and lobstermen themselves. And it's really, you know, you start to see that come full circle that, you know, people that 
she's got to work with and, and, you know, hopefully now are making their own impact on the industries here and, and the community here. So definitely that's a big thing that I know both of our organizations will continue to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it makes me think about the importance of these collaborative efforts. And one of the things, um, Nancy, that you, you were showing in your chart and somebody has commented on in the chat is sort of the, the different species, that the shift in species that we might see around here and how we can take some of the pressure off some of these some of these things and it makes me think of collaborations like with the LY fish restoration projects which have seen great success and are going to really um, provide crucial support for the sort of ecosystem and the balance in the ecosystems um, anybody want to sort of chime in about some of those larger collaborations well, new, and how it might help new ecosystem mm -hmm. Right. For the new ecosystem, because it's going to be black sea bass eating those alewives, but not cod. Right. <clears throat> but well, whatever, it's, it's, it, they, the, the alewives are a huge main success story, and um, I took we took our family up to watch them uh, uh, in not too far from where we live, and it's amazing to see them come through. And they and actually, Route 15 was closed for a whole month to to contribute to alewife uh, migration. So I think. It, Maine stands as a kind of model uh, for that kind of work. And it does, it is a definite way of reducing pressure on marine ecosystems is increasing the numbers of those fish that are the food for higher up on the food chain. And, there, and there, there's, a, there's an underlying lesson in those, it, it, those restorations too, which is that human beings can in fact do good things <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they put their hands on the land, right? It, it, there's 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 plenty of evidence to the you know to the opposite that human beings but human beings are not necessarily destroyers right we can be creators and and um, and we are also as a species capable of of trans dramatic and transformational change in short periods of time you know, I, I'm I'm trained as a historian and I know <laughs> that that, you know, that has happened in the past and it can it can happen again, and I think that's that's what what if if, if I hang on to hope in one in one particular way, it's that. But I, I that I know we are capable of making the changes that we need to make, it, um, and not just technologically, but I know it, you know as, as a species we can do it. But um, we have not summoned up the will yet. Uh, to, well, we're, to, we're we're working in the right direction. We're just not yeah. doing it big enough and fast enough. I mean, it is true that social change actually happens much faster now um, than, uh, than it used to. I mean, it used to take decades for something to happen. Now it happens in less than, than 10 years. Something yeah. was almost inconceivable, um, like, like marriage equality when I was growing up, inconceivable right. something like that would happen. And yet it happened actually once the groundwork had been laid, the, the transition happened very quickly. And yeah. we're very fortunate in the sense that the price of, renewable energy, particularly solar power and wind power has collapsed. Yeah. And that means that financially, you don't even need subsidies to, to go to a green energy situation. It's, it is a question of, I mean, you can speed it up with political efforts, but it is no longer the case that you have to subsidize solar power and wind power in order for it to be economically viable. And that's right. huge. And remember, we do subsidize the oil and gas industry. We still subsidize Exxon in the name of national security. Yep. Yeah. And Chrissy. Speaking of pests. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Julia, go ahead. Oh, no, just generally, just a quick comment that I think partnerships, collaboration, community partnerships, like certainly our two land trusts have worked together, but, but branching out beyond that, you know, with uh, for us down, or you guys too, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, um, you know, Department of Transportation, like we're, we're going to face with our causeway and, and, you know, many places around here, but just, I think, we'll reach more people and maybe have a greater impact uh, when we're able to, to partner up with relevant um, entities and, and, you know, hopefully make further strides. So I think that's just generally a, a, a something we're looking to, always open to, you know, working with other folks to have a greater impact. 
Yeah. Well, I was going to talk about um, the increase in pests and invasive plants, and I, I'll go to that in just a second. But that makes me think, Julia, about you know some of these pressures um, that we're thinking about that we're gonna we're gonna see in light of these changes are not just on development. If Maine is going to become a place, as Jeremy said, with a bigger growing season, a longer growing season, and we are losing the bread basket out west, it's drying up. So is Maine going to also see its resources being tapped harder for producing food to feed not just Maine, but to feed the country? And how are how is that going to change for us? I know that Hans has been involved with the Northeast Forest Network, which is working really closely with American Farmland Trust and thinking about the sort of Northeast forests and landscape and what do we need to do to prepare for this, not just for carbon sequestration, but for food production and things like that. Yeah, yeah in, in, in addition to the, the, the vision for conserving forest land throughout New England, there's a, there's a, a parallel, uh, a, um, documented that's the New England food vision essentially that that is that looks very carefully at, at what New England can produce for itself and you know and we're obviously we're never going to produce all of our food for ourselves here we could we could be producing a whole lot more of it than we are now and I think the challenge with climate change is going to be um, f farmers finding ways of controlling microclimates um, in order to take advantage of the longer growing season um, and mitigate some of the effects of, of, of extreme weather. Um, so farming is unlikely to look like it has for the last 150 or 200 years um, uh, in New England. It can't look like it looks out west. Um, the, 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 farming model that we have created since World War II in this country is has been nothing but extractive and destructive of, of the environment. Um, but technology, there is there are answers in technology for for growing food um, um, in innovative ways um, that take advantage of some of the changes that are happening and mitigate others. And, and it's and it's going to involve enclosed farming in, in some respects, I think. Um, and, um, you know, you know, in some ways, Elliot Coleman has been doing <laughs> the, the, the I, I right. was going to say Elliot told me that um, his farm, that an acre of Maine farmland can feed 130 people over a year. Yeah, and in, in terms of all they need, um, in terms of enclosed farming, there's something called Aero Farms, an abandoned steel tubing factory, and in, in uh, New Jersey is producing all the, the greens that a 130 acre well managed farm can do. Yeah. Um, the train has left the station in terms of the declining role of California. Um, it had overtaken uh, Wisconsin as the major dairy producing state, but the biggest agricultural use of water in California is hay for cows. And now Wisconsin is back again as the major um, dairy producing state in the United States. I, I'm actually very, um, I think New England could, could feed itself. I think New England could come very close to feeding itself as well as having a niche market for selling very high quality stuff elsewhere. Right. It's, um, but it needs a little bit of enlightenment about the way we farm. I, and we do have the highest number of small organic farms, not percentage, but highest number of small organic farms of any state in the United States. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think, a resource to build upon. And, and, that, and, and there, there's, a, there's a place where conservation organizations can insert themselves into, this, into the question in, in a very practical way. Um, we have been involved in conserving farmland um, for a long time. Um, but we need to be able to conserve farmland, particularly with easements in ways that allow for agricultural innovation and, and really writing easements that are about um, producing food and not necessarily about protecting the visual beauty of the agricultural landscape, which is sort of a 19th century artifact anyway. Um, 
but um, protecting farmland, protecting the places where we can grow food um, is tremendously important um, for us to, to prioritize and think about. And as and Jeremy said, I was going to say, as you said, thinking about the way we're changing farming, I mean, Flo Reed on here was saying, thinking about more regenerative practices and things like that. And, you know, thinking about different ways, like how Elliot's growing food and, you know, how to do, how to do more production with less land and less resources, less of a carbon footprint um, is all, are all changes that need to, need to happen. Well, if you visit any of the more prominent organic farms on the peninsula, they're tiny. Yeah. And the only reason they don't produce more food is because the market isn't there. Yeah. And, um, and of course, Elliot has mastered being able to do it in the winter. I, I miss the mainscape market because I used to love to tell my friends in New York that I could drive through the snow in February to Blue Hill, Maine, and buy better fresh lettuce and carrots and other stuff than they could in Manhattan. That's right. You know, right. I mean, the, the pandemic shut it down, but the capacity to do that, it, it's not just cute, it's really important in terms of future production, something that should be encouraged. And I think you land trust people have a big role to play in promoting useful food production on existing lands. Yeah, we, uh, we, we purchased 11 acres and a farmhouse um, right up on top of the hill across from the fairgrounds last year. Um, uh, basically, you know, initially just to protect some of the last sort of flat open farmland uh, in, you know, the village of Blue Hill. Um, uh, on the outskirts of it, anyway, but um, but we are we are partnering partnering with a, another nonprofit that is going to do um, research, agricultural research, and, and work on some of these innovative ways of growing food. Um, it, it's not it's not what we have capacity to do as an organization, but we as a land holding organization can can house these kinds of things um, and, and try to target, you know, try to target other organizations that are innovating in ways that we can support, um, even though it's not our main, main mission. Um, and I want to make the point that every head of lettuce that you buy grown by Elliot Coleman or King Hill Farm or any of those places is not only nice in quality and all the rest, but it's less carbon footprint right. compared to buying a head of lettuce, which doesn't taste good because it's a week old when you get it, at best, that came from California. Right. Right. The uh, food waste in this country is enormous. Yep. Something yep. like between a third and a half of all the food that's transported from the West Coast to the East Coast spoils en route and is thrown away, which is a big source of emissions. The yep. growing of it was a huge source of emissions. And, and getting it to us is a huge source of emission. So by promoting local agriculture, you're doing a big step towards reducing carbon emissions throughout the country by eating food that was grown close to you instead of food that was put in a diesel truck and yep. driven for five straight days to get in a market to New York, which then sits in a warehouse to come to Boston or us up here, yeah, it's, it's insane. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and there, there again, the you know, the, it, it's it's the what we choose to subsidize at at a national level and what we choose to support because that model only works because um, of the, the subsidies that that we give to large ag um, doing things like that. If, it also only works because there's been enough water to drink in California. Right. Right. But as the water goes down, people right. trump agriculture. So the Central Valley is in a very precarious position because LA and San Francisco and Santa Barbara can get the water for people to drink. And that's going to have a huge depressing effect on the amount of agricultural production in California. So even subsidies be damned, it's not going to make any difference. If there's not any water, they're not going to be able to grow it. And yeah. so you're going to see inevitably a shift back 
to the Northeast and the Midwest that used to be yes. the food, but Iowa used to produce more than 50 different kinds of food commercially. Right. Now all it produces is corn, soy, and hogs. Right. With enormous emissions. Right. right. I'd like to, to shift over to something, Jeremy, you also were pointing out, which was talking about how we're gonna see an increase in pests and invasive plants and things like that. And I'd, I'd love to hear from the land trust about what they're already seeing. Julia, I know that IHT has been dealing with brown tail moth for a lot longer than Blue Hill Heritage Trust has, which is so interesting since we're so close. We just have the Egamog and Reach separating our properties. But you guys have really been seeing an increase. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been um, it's been tough, and you know, I will give credit to my predecessor Paul Miller uh, for being really on top of it. You know, when they first were really identified on the island, they weren't having a community wide impact yet. Um, most folks didn't even really know what they were. It was already bad down in Brunswick Topsam area. Uh, you know, who's to say exactly what happened? You know, we have a lot of shipping in and out of Deer Isle with the lobster industry. Um, and, you know, I mean, pests, animals, plants move around in various ways. It's probably some sort of human connection or birds or whatever. But they showed up uh, actually on Little Deer Isle um, and, and sort of, you know, the top of North Deer Isle first. And we noticed them on our property, Scott's Landing. Uh, we have a little... Um, kind of pull out at the on the little deer isle side of the causeway and notice them in you know the hawthorns in uh fruit trees um in the alders anyway they it, it was clear that it was going to become much worse and we started to try to do outreach almost right away and the first year we had you know folks who were already interested in iht came out and said oh good to know and then just a year later, they were coming to us saying, oh, can we borrow those pole pruners? So we did a lending program, the clip and hold pole pruners, or, or we had folks who were willing to go help if somebody was elderly and couldn't do it themselves. And, you know, would go knock on their neighbor's doors and say, hey, I, I just clipped my, my, my webs. And I noticed you have some too. And it's, you know, it's not gonna make much difference if, unless we both take care of this. And, and by this past summer, uh, really the entire island you know, even folks who didn't know that IHT had been talking about this for a couple of years, really actually felt it personally, experienced it. And um, we brought in a state entomologist to come and talk uh, at a town meeting and, you know, been trying to provide resources to folks, certainly taking care of our own properties, but also trying to do outreach and provide resources and tools to community members so that they can take care of it too. Because as we know, uh, you know, the ecosystem's all, all connected. Uh, no, no single property is its own little bubble. Um, so it's been a challenge, but, and unfortunately, I think we all know this, um, human nature seems to be that until it affects you personally, for some people, they never, they don't really believe it's real until it personally affects them. And it unfortunately did take that um, for this to become an island-wide uh, understanding or, or problem. Um, but, you know, it's, it's inevitable. So many of these things are. And I think actually one of the things, this is an example of how I think we can make meaningful change on a local scale is, is to the uh, capacity that we have, which it can be limited, meet people where they're at. You know, here, here is this pole pruner. You can, you can take it, you can take it home. Maybe we, never, maybe we never get it back. Oh, well, we eat a few dollars, but like meet people where they're at try to really give them the tools that they need to make, you know, homestead scale or, or, you know, small personal individual scale changes that help the entire community. So that was, that's kind of an example for us. Yeah. And then take, take this moment where people are getting very uncomfortable <laughs> because yeah, as exactly. said, it's, it's a major threat to our health. Right. I mean, brown tail moth is a great example that's a very real thing that we can use as an educational moment to teach about, about climate change and about these effects that we are gonna feel. I think so right. often the climate change can feel very abstract to people until like you said, Julia, it becomes personal. Be careful about 
climate change, though, and brown tail moth, because, you know, it was a huge problem a long time ago. Yeah. And then it retreated to just outer Cape Cod and one other place, and we blew it, and we didn't wipe it out when yeah. it was located. And, and so I wouldn't be surprised if climate change is a big component of it, but it's much more complicated than that. Mm. Um, it's in contrast to the tick situation, which is sure. a slam dunk, obvious effect. And the Northern migration, we are the pine tree state. And if that New Jersey pine barren borer gets up here, we're gonna be a whole lot less pine tree state. And yeah. those things are clearly um, climate change related. Um, other things are more complex, and I, I think we need to be we need to be careful about that. Yeah. Um, so that um, you know some idiot doesn't come along and say, ah, you're just you know blah 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 blah. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, th I think working working with in invasives is a, is also a, a way of engaging people with other kinds of land stewardship and land management. Um, that um, are not just about eradicating something, but are in fact about building back <clears throat> ecosystems and and doing doing good work um, and 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 healing things. Um, I, I I have uh, I have really mixed feelings about the whole invasive um, conversation sometimes because I I. I feel like sometimes it turns into open warfare against um, um, species which are just doing what <laughs> nature is telling them to do. And I think um, I think we need to have a more nuanced conversation about um, about how we deal with them. Acknowledging fully that you know when barberry gets into an area, it can just take over and 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 wreck things. Um, but remember the, the way we talk about invasive species is also natural migration right. because of climate right. change. I actually went to a meeting of all the chair, the directors of all the national parks in the United States to talk about how are they gonna deal with the fact that they are by law um, mandated to preserve an ecosystem that is inevitably doomed. Right. And so you're the, you're the manager of Yellowstone Park and the dominant tree species are, want to change. Yeah. Uh, Yellowstone will be a better place if you let them change. Yeah. And yet you're stuck with this old point of view that um, you're required to get rid of these things that are moving in. So that's another way in which invasiveness has become much more complicated because, you know, frankly, fishermen are going to be very grateful for black sea bass right. because they're going to be able to make a living with, from a fish, which is actually worth a lot more money than cod. Right. And so I'm wondering what are going to be the trees that dominate forests in Blue Hill in 20 or 30 years? Are they going to be the same species or different? And I guess that's a challenge to you people. Um, how do you keep an open mind about that? Yeah, it, it, it is. And I, and I think we're not locked into the, the, the static vision by we're not we're not locked in by statute <laughs> right to, to the static vision of environment we are we're locked in into it because of perception and 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 sort of what we think of as cultural norms but um yeah it's it you know clearly we are going to you know if we came back in 50 years we're, we're going to see a, a a forest which is dominated you know by many more deciduous trees it's going to you know it might be a white oak White, white oak forest. It might be something else, but it's gonna be it's gonna be very different. Um, and um, I think the other the other part of the invasive um, conversation, which is important, is that that invasive species almost always get their biggest foothold and do their worst in areas where we have already damaged things <laughs> extensively. Um, and if we can work at the landholder level at creating diverse and healthy ecosystems, then I think the, the so-called invasives are going to be less invasive and less damaging. Um, mm -hmm. um, 
but they but they are they do have the ability to outcompete things in disrupted situations, and that's that's kind of the larger thing that we have to try to heal. Or on islands. I mean, invasive species can be really problematic on islands. Yes. Yeah. And then some. And in some cases, you know, you really have to just deal with them. And you know, there's yeah. not much nuance. Uh, there have been amazing recoveries of seabirds, for example on islands where rats have been eradicated. It's one of the most powerful tools we have in terms of island conservation, broadly speaking, is to get rid of uh, the rats, cats, in some cases goats. Uh, yeah. Hawaii, for example, has, uh, you know, has a huge number of invasive species, but where they get rid of the they, where they get rid of them, you, know, you get native vegetation coming back. So, you know, it's a, it's, there's a difference between the things that are sort of naturally moving up as the climate gets warmer that really um, it's kind of a loss, you know, for, we should be reducing climate change, but we have to accept the, I mean, some of it we have to just accept because it it's already baked into the system versus, yeah. you know, really human transported. Right, uh, introduced stuff. Sometimes you do have to get rid of, so they're not all in the same kettle of fish, so to speak. Yeah, I know Julia uh, may have to pop off here. Um, I have one more topic I wanted to bring up because it has come up a couple of times here on the chat. And it was something I had written down too. I'd love to talk a little more about carbon sequestration and what's, what's happening. I know that's something um, both of you talked about and it's, it's a market that is changing. Carbon sequestration credits are changing. And I know Nancy discussed the idea of kelp farms um, we know that there's a lot, you know, a lot of carbon sequestration benefit in forest lands, things like that. Um, so, Julie, if you have to hop off at some point, go ahead. But if you have something to say about this, go ahead and speak first. <laughs> yeah, um, this is something that I've, I've known about the topic for quite some time. It's obviously becoming more and more um, discussed regularly, certainly, for example, at the National Land Trust Alliance Conference, they're, they're, they have programs on it. There's, um, you know, companies and organizations now that exist to help uh, anyone, whether it's a land trust or a, a, a landowner, um, look into what carbon sequestration they could do in their own properties. For us on Deer Isle, um, you know, we, I, I mentioned this earlier, I would love to see us do more in terms of maybe it's not traditional land conservation. Maybe we're not going to get, you know, the the bulk of the sort of undisturbed or, or undeveloped forest on Deer Isle, for example, is tons of spaghetti lots and weird, you know, strange subdivisions or 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 there's, you know, a few large landowners, but it's so, you know, messy, so to speak, that it would be really hard to conserve it under our traditional practices of either taking something in title ownership fee or in conservation easement. Um, so how, how can we work with communities, with community members to um, manage woodlots, uh, you know, it's that are still socioeconomic, but also, you know, understand that they could benefit um, the you know, the environment and also maybe their their pocketbook by doing carbon sequestration. So I'm not exactly sure how we fit into that yet. Um, I know here on the island where our boundaries are very visual and defined by the ocean, it's, it's complicated. It's a super complicated discussion, but I think we're gonna have more success at that discussion if it's not about us acquiring the land in some way in one of the traditional fashions, but in partnering with, uh, with folks on, on talking about what they could do with their land and, and you know, understanding that it's part of the bigger conservation picture of this community, of this landscape. I you know, don't have the answers for that now, obviously, but that's, that's how I imagine us working uh, you know, on that sort of scale here, just because we don't, like I said, our borders as an island are very visual and clearly defined and shrinking. Um, so it's, it's complicated to say, oh, we're going to go acquire, you know, hundreds of acres of forest uh, down here. It's it's a little different, but and actually, one of the topics we're talking about too is um, trying to do some forestry management on the islands, the offshore islands off of Deer Isle, which are small. You know, it's not landscape scale, but they do they are really critical ecosystems to seabirds or migratory birds or other 
um, you know, the, the fisheries that surround them. And so that's an interesting challenge that we have as well, that we're just sort of trying to figure out what that might look like for us in the next 10, 20 years. Great. You know, I would say that um, carbon sequestration, uh, carbon credits, as they're called, is that it's actually a really complicated topic. Um, and um, the Nature Conservancy, which I'm, I, I serve on their boards, has, does a lot of work on it. Um, you have to be um, really clear about what's called additionality, which means that um, that in order to get a credit, it can't be just to to keep land that was already protected, protected. So it has to be what extra are you doing? Are you restoring the land? Are you managing in a way that increases the amount of carbon sequestration? Or are you buying land that would otherwise be converted to say a parking lot? So you have to be, there's, and I think all the major conservation organizations are you know, working through a very quickly changing landscape, but there's no question that done properly Car the carbon credit market can provide really important financial resources for conservation, but it's but and, there's been a lot of sloppy carbon credits, and so I think you know five years from now, I think the the whole situation will be a lot clearer in terms of standards and and also pricing, of course, of carbon credits is going to change a lot. I suspect in the future as well. And and the the, the technology is changing quickly too, um, even in the last five years. So before I came to Maine, one of the last things I did before leaving Connecticut was to put a California ARB project on 6,500 acres um, of forest land down there. And um, at that point, 6,500 acres was about the minimum size that you could do a carbon project on because of the, the technology really of, of, of surveying the forest, of, of inventorying the forest. Um, and those levels have come down dramatically to the point where you, know, you, can, you can aggregate even 50 acre parcels um, onto a, a property. But you're absolutely right about the, the management aspect of, of uh, the forests. Um, sequestering carbon in trees standing on the ground is one thing. The other important part of it is managing your forest so that when you do take product out of your forest, you are taking quality product out that will then get turned into something which continues to sequester <laughs> the carbon um, in the product as opposed to, you know, getting pulped up and or, you know, so, we're, you know, we're really talking about managing for high, you know, high value timber, um, which will get used in, in buildings and in furniture and things like, like that. Um, but I, I do see a role for land trusts in helping uh, not only ourselves in terms of what we can do in, in terms of carbon projects on our properties, but also helping people in the community understand this changing landscape of the market. And, and it's, it's a little bit less wild westy now than it was even five years ago. Um, the California market has proved itself to be, you know, pretty solid. And 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 I and I do think that projects that are certified under California are in fact doing something good for the climate issue, and they're also helping landowners. Um, ease some of the pressures which lead to bad land management. Um, you know, landowners quite often make bad decisions about their about their forest land because they're forced to economically. And the, and the carbon market is a potential way of helping people make better decisions about, about their property. Um, so, and, you know, and when I look, you know, Julia talked about the, the, the sort of broken up parcelization of, of the island down there. I, I do look at carbon projects as a, as a possible way of dealing with those situations that we have um, in the centers of some of our towns, which are highly important forest lands. They're highly important wetlands. They're, they're really not developed and they shouldn't be developed. And yet they're all chopped up into these little individual woodlots. And if we can help, if we can help landowners find a way of aggregating that into something larger um, while maintaining their private ownership and their use of their property, but to, to make that into some, um, some kind of economic and legal entity that, that can be conserved and also be put into, into a, a carbon market. I, I think we, I think we can make, we can make a big footprint in a pretty short period of time. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I have, it, it's a little clearer to me now than it was even a couple of years ago. Um, and, it, and it mostly has to do with the changes in the way that, that 
Um, we can model forests with computers and understand the carbon in them and also the, the technology for actually going out and inventorying what's, what's in the forest. Great. Jeremy or Nancy, do you have anything to add to any of this <laughs> before we wrap up? Um. I guess I'll just say, remind people that there is so much that can be done, needs to be done. And as um, Joan Bias said, my generation, action is the antidote to despair. I'm not gonna add anything to that. <laughs> Although it, it, it's really fun to hear you guys talk about forests. I remember I studied under the great ecologist, Evelyn Hutchinson at Yale, who pointed out to all of us students that Connecticut used to be the hay field for horses in New York City, right. and that New England was essentially deforested a century ago. Right. And the great evil automobile and gasoline is what promoted the regeneration of New England forest. <laughs> and, and besides the irony of that, uh, I, and it was of course oil that saved the whales because whales would be extinct if it hadn't been for the discovery of marketable petroleum. But the, the importance of knowing the transformation of New England is yeah. to remind us of the extraordinary scale of change which is possible. Uh, my understanding is that New England is roughly 75% forested today. I've seen lower and bigger numbers. That's a hell of a lot more than 10 or 20% forested, when even Northwestern Maine was forested um, for the timber industry. So we have seen in a century an extraordinary transformation in a good way of the landscape of New England and Maine in particular because of this. And I think it's a real demonstration of the kinds of magnitude of changes that are possible. We, we, we are lucky enough to live in, in one of the most resilient places around. Um, there, there are a lot of places where human beings have done the kind of damage that we did in New England in the 18th and 19th century that have never recovered. Um, and, and New England hasn't, in fact. It had the good fortune to be able to recover. Yes. Right. As opposed to desertification in the, in the exactly. Fertile Crescent or whatever. And, exactly. and we need to hold on to that and make it even better. We do, and it's and it's worth it's worth noting that twenty thousand acres a year is, is being converted of, of forest land is being converted um, in New England and lost um, to de, um, to to development, and that's something that we absolutely need to to stop. Um, and we need we need to protect the, the, the this this is one of the key forests on the planet um, when you put it in the in the context of the whole Northeast, and we need and we need to protect it. And you know, it's very, it's a very interesting moment right now also because of the growth of the infrastructure for renewable energy and how you balance that. I, one of the most frustrating conversations I've been having recently is that it's so much cheaper to cut, to put solar panels on land where you cut down the trees than it is to put on rooftops and parking lots. That almost has to be a policy change. There need to be incentives so that the least destructive forms of renewable energy are installed. Because we have to have renewable energy. But we should do it in a way that that is additive to our forest lands, not subtractive. That's right. So, so, so Jeremy point. mentioned that Connecticut was the hay field for New York City and, and the development of the automobile allowed reforestation. And, and something else to remember is that the, the automobile was also looked at as a pollution control device because all of those horses were burying New York City and every other city in, in horse manure. Syria, and and that, right. was, that, was, that was causing health problems. And, and all of a sudden this wonderful thing, the internal combustion engine came along and it cleaned up the streets and everything was great. <laughs> for, for, so. a bit of humor, for a bit of humor, I can't recommend more highly a book with the wonderful title, Heartbeats in the Muck, The History of New York Harbor by John Waldman. It's actually a brilliant book. And in that book, he describes the, the horse pollution and the unhealthiness of the East River, yeah. which is absolutely appalling. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, as a dyed-in-the-wool New Yorker who transplanted to Maine, 
I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, it, it, it's a hell of a lot better now than it was when it was full right. of orchids. That's why, that's why all the rich people came to Maine in the 19th century to get away from that <laughs> in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll call this a wrap. Uh, Julia and Hans, thank you so much for sharing what we're doing. I'm going to give a big plug uh, for folks to support their local land trust if they uh, if they want to be a part of action uh, towards climate resiliency and mitigation. Uh, you have two great local sources right here in this region, and we're so grateful to Jeremy and Nancy for joining us sharing their expertise and just really helping to get this incredibly important information out there. Thank you both so much for your time. This was really terrific. Uh, that's yes. great thank, to do it. Thank you, everybody. Our pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you all. And thank you, Chrissy. You bet. All right, okay. we're gonna end it now and we'll get this out there, uh, out there shortly. Have a great night, everybody.